Do you want a big picture overview of why our criminal justice system needs improvement, especially regarding our overuse of prisons? Today's episode will give you that by exploring key information and insights provided by the landmark 2016 report of the Illinois Commission on Criminal Justice and Sentencing Reform. I know what you're probably thinking. Blue Ribbon Commissions seem like they're a dime a dozen. But for those interested in criminal justice reform, this report is a gold mine of information and perspective. From the outset, the commission was different than most, partly because of its composition of subject matter experts, key stakeholders, and a bipartisan group of legislators, but also because it started off with the charge from then-Governor Rauner to come up with a practical plan to achieve a specific outcome namely to safely reduce the Illinois prison population by 25% by 2025. That outcome-oriented mission was followed by two years of commission work, culminating in the remarkably practical and valuable report that we'll explore in this episode. This is Justice Voices, stories that need to be told, voices that need to be heard. Welcome. I'm your host, David Risley. Rather than summarize the report in my own words, because it's so well written and dense with information, for the most part, I'm going to let the report speak for itself. I'll focus primarily on the background information in Part 2 of the report, which is divided into four subsections. The role of prisons, the impact of high incarceration, the resource question, or what I refer to as the resource riddle, And finally, guiding principles and operating assumptions. So now, just sit back and imagine you're listening to an audiobook as I share this big-picture portion of the Commission's report. Quoting from the report itself, Before offering the Commission's recommendations, it is useful to set forth a brief summary of Illinois' and the country's recent use of prison what research shows about the impact of high incarceration rates on public safety and the challenges that a 25% reduction presents. A. The Role of Prisons In recent years, Illinois' prison population has reached a record high of almost 50,000 inmates in a system designed for 32,000 people making the Illinois Department of Corrections one of the largest and most crowded prison systems in the United States. This was not always the case. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, Illinois' incarceration rate remained comparatively stable at between 54 and 66 inmates per 100,000 citizens, with its prisons housing fewer than 10,000 people. This changed in the late 1970s when policymakers responded to spikes in crime by adopting laws and policies that both broadened the number of crimes for which offenders could be imprisoned and increased the length of time prisoners remained behind bars. This policy shift was supported by an equally profound shift in penal philosophy. For most of the 20th century, Illinois followed national trends in making rehabilitation the central focus of its corrections policy. But by the 1970s, there was growing agreement among politicians and opinion leaders that, quote, nothing worked, close quote, to rehabilitate offenders, and that the most effective response to crime was increasing the use of prison to incapacitate current offenders and to deter future ones. The result has been that over the last four decades, the Illinois prison population has grown from fewer than 10,000 to a recent high of about 49,000 inmates. More alarmingly, the rate of imprisonment increased more than five-fold from about 66 inmates per 100,000 citizens in 1975 to almost 380 inmates per 100,000 in 2014. During this same period, the annual appropriation for the Illinois Department of Corrections increased from about $52 million to more than $1.4 billion. These changes in Illinois have mirrored national trends. As the National Academy of Sciences recently concluded, quote, 
The growth in incarceration rates in the United States over the past 40 years is historically unprecedented and internationally unique, close quote. In addition, quote, the U.S. penal population of 2.2 million adults is the largest in the world. Close to 25% of the world's prisoners are held in American prisons, although the United States accounts for about 5% of the world's population. The U.S. rate of incarceration, with nearly one of every 100 adults in prison or jail, is five to ten times higher than rates in Western Europe and other democracies. Close quote. While the U.S. leads the world in the number of people it incarcerates, the country's use of prison has a disproportionate impact on the poor and on minorities. Quoting from a footnoted source, Of those behind bars in 2011, about 60% were minorities, 858,000 blacks and 464,000 Hispanics. The largest impact of the prison buildup has been on poor minority men. African-American men born since the late 1960s are more likely to have served time in prison than to have completed college with a four-year degree. African-American men under age 35 who failed to finish high school are now more likely to be behind bars than employed in the labor market. Close quote. Illinois prison population shows comparable disparities. In 2016, non-Hispanic whites made up roughly 62% of Illinois' total population, but accounted for only 30% of the state's prison population. In contrast, African Americans made up about 15% of the state's population, but almost 57% of its prison inmates. African Americans are thus incarcerated in Illinois at a rate that is eight times higher than that of non-Hispanic whites. Hispanics made up almost 17% of the state's population, 12.6% of its prison population, and were incarcerated at almost twice the rate of non-Hispanic whites. Public discussion of prison often focuses on the number of people who are incarcerated, the conditions of their confinement, and the costs of incarceration. This focus obscures the fact that prison is not simply a place we send offenders, it is also a system that releases offenders, who must then confront the challenges of living on the outside. In Illinois, the vast majority of all prisoners will eventually leave prison. Indeed, almost 30,000 inmates are released each year. Those who are released will return to society, but too often with unsuccessful results. Roughly 50% will return to prison within three years of their release, either because they committed a new offense or because they violated a condition of their supervised release. The result is a frustrating, expensive, and inefficient churning of people through the prison system. Most of the people being sent to prison are relatively low-level, nonviolent offenders. Often these people are sent to prison not because they are especially dangerous to the community, but because they consistently engage in low-level criminal conduct. A great many have lengthy criminal records, and from the perspective of many police, prosecutors, and judges, the only appropriate option is to incarcerate and incapacitate. So offenders are sent to prison, often serve relatively little time. The average length of stay in the Illinois Department of Corrections is less than two years, and then are released. They then frequently reoffend, are returned to prison, and the cycle continues. I'm going to parenthetically add a comment of my own here. As I said in my introductory episode, in 2018, when I was Director of Public Safety Policy in the Illinois Governor's Office, I asked the Department of Corrections to provide me with the median time that inmates spent in their custody. The report that I just read provided the mean time, which is the average time, which they said was two years. But that can be a bit misleading because that figure is skewed upward by those serving long sentences. What I wanted to know was what was the median time, meaning the midpoint, the hinge point, the length of time at which half the prison population spends less and half spend more time in prison. 
The answer I was given was that in fiscal year 2018, the median time inmates spent in prison was only eight months. In other words, fully half the Illinois prison population spent only eight months or less in prison. At a true cost calculated by the Illinois Sentencing Policy Advisory Council to be almost $70,000 per inmate per year. Now, getting back to the Commission report, as they comment on the relatively high rate at which people are recycled back to prison after being released. From the report, quoting, One reason for this high recidivism rate is that offenders too often have gotten too little help, either in prison or afterward, in addressing the problems that contributed to their criminal behavior. National research shows that, on average, prisoners have, quote, less than 12 years of schooling, have low levels of functional literacy, score low on cognitive tests, often have histories of drug addiction, mental illness, violence, and or impulsive behavior, and have little work experience prior to incarceration, with at least one quarter to one third of inmates being unemployed at the time of their incarceration, close quote. Here again, Illinois follows national trends. A little less than half of Illinois prisoners have a high school education, and most read at a sixth grade level or lower. Roughly 27% of inmates are receiving ongoing mental health services, and about half of all inmates have been assessed as needing substance abuse treatment. While it was never designed, funded, or adequately staffed for these purposes, Illinois' prison system has become the de facto remedial education, health, and substance abuse treatment system of last resort for some of the state's most disadvantaged citizens. Section B. The Impact of High Incarceration The fact that Illinois makes extensive use of its prisons does not on its own compel the conclusion that change is required. Prisons serve a vital role in society. They help hold offenders responsible for their actions, they protect victims and other members of the public, and they provide a concrete way of labeling offenders' conduct as worthy of condemnation. But the importance of these goals is precisely why the state must reduce its prison population. The problem that Illinois faces is not only that its prisons are crowded and overly expensive, but also that the state overuses incarceration in ways that can affirmatively frustrate the system's goals. Stated differently, incarcerating offenders excessively or unnecessarily undermines the Department of Corrections mission of, quote, promoting positive change in offender behavior, operating successful reentry programs, and reducing victimization, close quote. In the course of the commission's work, Several problems with Illinois' over-reliance on incarceration have emerged. 1. An excessive rate of incarceration incapacitates more than public safety requires. One benefit of imprisonment is that it incapacitates the offender, preventing him or her from committing additional crimes while he or she is behind bars. Over the past 40 years, Illinois has more than quintupled its rate of incarceration, fueled in significant part by its pursuit of this benefit. And while many inmates are imprisoned for reasons other than simply incapacitation, most obviously to punish because of the great harm inflicted by the crime, the impact of the high levels of incapacitation on the overall crime rate is far from clear. Research shows that the relationship between incarceration rates and crime rates is complex, and that the greater use of prison does not automatically translate into less offending. One effect of high levels of imprisonment is that we end up incapacitating far more people than is necessary. Research has consistently shown that a small percentage of persistent offenders are responsible for most crime, particularly violent crime, and that other factors, such as increasing age, diminish the likelihood of future criminal behavior regardless of whether the offender is behind bars. In this respect, when the use of imprisonment fails to distinguish between chronic offenders and those who are unlikely to re-offend, 
it constitutes a poor use of the state's resources, particularly given the availability of more effective community-based alternatives. The result is a problem of diminishing returns. The more Illinois has increased its use of prison, particularly to include low-risk offenders, and the more it has lengthened sentences beyond the point where offenders present a statistical risk to public safety, the more it has needlessly imposed the high costs of imprisonment on the offender and the state. Incapacitation as a justification for punishment is limited in other ways. Research shows that for several categories of offenders, an incapacitation strategy of crime prevention can misfire because most or all of those sent to prison are rapidly replaced in the criminal networks in which they participate. Street-level drug trafficking are an example of this dynamic. In spite of enforcement strategies dedicated to the arrest and conviction of current drug dealers, experience has consistently shown that the street-level drug market continues to thrive as other people take their place. Quote, Similar analyses apply to many members of deviant youth groups and gangs. As members and even leaders are arrested and removed from circulation, others take their place. Arrests and imprisonments of easily replaceable offenders create illicit opportunities for others. Close quote. 2. Illinois' crowded prisons undermine the justice system's capacity to rehabilitate. In contrast to the previous views that nothing works to rehabilitate offenders, a substantial body of evidence has developed over the past 20 years that now convincingly demonstrates the opposite. Rehabilitative programming can reduce recidivism when it addresses the needs offenders have that led them to engage in criminal behavior. This same body of research also shows that prisons, particularly crowded prisons, tend to be criminogenic which means they tend to make offenders more likely to reoffend. This effect happens through housing high-risk with low-risk offenders, combined with reducing the chances of healthy family relationships and of legitimate employment that can dissuade people from criminal behavior. These findings lead to two conclusions. First, that effective prison programming is essential to rehabilitation. And second, that when consistent with public safety, it is preferable and less expensive to provide offenders with rehabilitative programming in a community-based setting rather than in prison. Excessive incarceration hinders the implementation of both of those conclusions. The personnel, administrative, and housing costs associated with a high number of inmates means that there's little left for programming. In fiscal year 2015, for instance, Slightly more than 3% of the Illinois Department of Corrections' total budget was dedicated to programming. High numbers of inmates also means that the programming that is offered is frequently insufficient. Even when a large number of inmates being ineligible by rule for receiving sentence credit for programming, there are too many prisoners competing for too few program slots. And as discussed below, most of the programs are not evidence-based, have not been evaluated for effectiveness, and fail to separate the low- and high-risk offenders. This leads to a grim assessment. Illinois' prisons not only lack the capacity to deliver effective rehabilitative programming, but they also likely increase victimization by making some offenders worse. Just as importantly, Excessive incarceration hampers the ability to deliver rehabilitative services outside of prison. The state's deep investment in prisons has stymied the development of a systemic ability to sanction, supervise, and treat offenders in the community. 3. High levels of incarceration are unlikely to deter future crimes sufficiently to offset the high costs. For years, sentencing law and policy has seemed grounded in the belief that harsher sentences would lead directly to a greater deterrent effect, and thus to lower levels of crime. Sentencing ranges were increased, mandatory prison sentences were required for more crimes, 
and sentencing credits were reduced, all with the expectation that greater punishment would deter more offenders. Research and experience has shown that these assumptions are mistaken, at least in part. While criminal punishment generally has a broad deterrent effect, research does not support the assumption that increasing prison sentences is an effective or efficient way to increase deterrence, particularly if sentences are already lengthy. Research also suggests that high rates of incarceration can weaken deterrence by making the experience of incarceration more common. This is particularly problematic for communities that experience both high levels of crime and incarceration. The risk to public safety is that when potential offenders see prison as a normal experience, the threat of incarceration has less power to deter. 4. Because incarceration disproportionately affects poor communities, it risks exacerbating their existing social and economic disadvantages and thus can damage both their ability to reduce crime outside of the justice system and their relationship with the justice system. High levels of incarceration are not evenly distributed across the population. Instead, incarceration is highly and persistently concentrated in communities that tend to suffer not just from higher levels of crime, but also from other social and economic disadvantages, like high levels of unemployment, poverty, family dysfunction, and racial isolation. When it is effective, incarceration is an important tool for removing and incapacitating dangerous offenders who threaten a community's well-being. But research suggests that incarceration may have a tipping point, beyond which its public safety benefits are overwhelmed by harmful, unintended, community-level consequences. While this tipping-point dynamic plays out across the state, it is particularly clear in Cook County, which is the source of roughly half of Illinois' prison population. Despite the large percentage of people from Cook County in the state's prison system, the overwhelming majority come from and return to a small number of impoverished, mostly African-American neighborhoods on Chicago's south and west sides. While overall crime has dropped throughout Chicago in the past 20 years, these neighborhoods continue to suffer from persistently high rates of violence, as well as persistently high levels of incarceration among its residents. Research suggests that these neighborhoods continue to experience high levels of crime in part because the state's overuse of incarceration can aggregate their long-standing concentrations of social and economic disadvantages. For instance, a lack of legitimate economic opportunity, endemic in these higher incarceration neighborhoods, is associated with higher rates of criminal behavior. At the same time, Exposure to prison and the collateral consequences that attend a conviction make it difficult for former inmates to find legitimate employment. The lack of employment, in turn, makes it harder for this population to successfully reintegrate into society after prison and more likely to return to crime. As most prisoners are parents, this dynamic also increases the likelihood that their children will become involved in crime and be incarcerated. These negative effects can weaken a community's ability to control crime in two ways. On the one hand, high incarceration rates can cause breakdowns in the informal power all communities have to control crime through shared norms, associations, and practices that influences people's behavior. In addition, an over-reliance on formal control can damage the relationship between communities and the justice system. High rates of incarceration can contribute to the lack of trust many residents in the most disadvantaged neighborhoods have in the criminal justice system's legitimacy, which is the belief people have that the system is fair, acts in the community's interest, and has the moral authority to do so. When people don't trust the system's legitimacy, they are less likely to report crimes and cooperate with police, which in turn leads to lower apprehension rates weaker deterrence, and a greater willingness to resort to self-help. 
It is thus not surprising that research has found that high levels of legal cynicism are associated with high rates of crime. Subsection C. The Resource Question. On January 1, 2015, the Illinois prison population stood at 48,278. A 25% reduction would mean a prison population of 36,209 by the year 2025. There are many obstacles to reaching this goal, but perhaps none is as obvious as the problem of making significant systemic change in a world of limited resources. On average, it costs more than $22,000 per year to incarcerate a prisoner in Illinois, more than $37,000 when capital costs pension contributions, and employee benefits are factored in. Parenthetically, I'm going to insert here that, as already noted, more comprehensive analysis by the Illinois Sentencing Policy Council has shown that the true cost, the total cost, of incarcerating prisoners in Illinois is $70,000 per prisoner per year. And now returning to the Commission's report. It therefore is tempting to assume that reductions in the prison population will quickly translate into cost savings. That assumption is almost certainly wrong, at least in the near term. With prisons currently operating at 150% of design capacity, it will take many years of deep reductions in the number of inmates before the Department of Corrections will be able to operate on a smaller, less expensive scale. A large percentage of the department's costs are fixed, and they will not change quickly or proportionately with the decrease in the number of inmates. More importantly, long-term savings will stem from the more complicated task of keeping people out of prison. To sustain a reduction in the prison population, Illinois must build the capacity to hold more offenders accountable through alternatives to incarceration, strengthen the role of communities in reducing crime, and reduce recidivism. This will require resources, but more importantly, a change in how the state thinks about its criminal justice system. The Illinois Department of Corrections is the state's single largest investment in reducing offending and victimization, and yet Illinois has never funded the Department of Corrections based on its ability to affect these goals. Instead, the Department of Corrections funding has always been focused on meeting the demands of its annual inputs and outputs, how many people the state incarcerates and supervises on mandatory supervised release, sometimes called parole, in a given year. But even by this measurement, the Department of Corrections budget has struggled in recent years to keep pace with the growing inmate population. Since 2005, Illinois' budget for the Department of Corrections has remained relatively flat, even as the prison population has increased by nearly 9%. As a result, Illinois spends too much on its prisons given the state's fiscal needs, but too little given the number of people it incarcerates. This points to the real challenge of reducing the prison population. The essential goal for reform is not to find a better way for Illinois to pay for the system it has today. Instead, the goal should be to make the best use of its resources to create and sustain a system that reduces victimizations, improves public safety, and strengthens communities. When drafting its recommendations, the Commission sought to strike a balance. It did not ignore proposals because they were likely to be too expensive but it also tried to be realistic about the foreseeable budget constraints, both now and in the future. Ultimately, however, the Commission concluded that the relevant question is not whether reforms will cost little or a lot, but rather, a, how the costs of change compare to the costs of maintaining the status quo, and b, does the benefit of reform justify the call for additional resources? Subsection D. Guiding Principles and Operating Assumptions In crafting its recommendations, the Commission was guided by a set of normative principles and operating assumptions about the nature and types of reforms that are likely to be successful. 
normative principles. Proposals should adhere to the two core purposes of criminal punishment articulated in Illinois State Constitution, Article 1, Section 11. Quote, All penalties shall be determined both according to the seriousness of the offense and with the objective of restoring the offender to useful citizenship. Close quote. Proposals should aim to provide a sufficient number but not greater amount of punishment than is needed to achieve the goals of the sentencing and criminal justice policy. Proposals should strengthen communities' ability to control crime and increase public safety. Proposals should respect the needs of crime victims and support victims' rights. Operating Assumptions no recommendation should create an unnecessary or undue risk to public safety, regardless of the effect on the prison population. But it is impossible to reduce the prison population significantly without creating some risk that offenders who might previously have been incarcerated will now commit new offenses. Recommendations should be supported by the best available research, and implementation must be monitored to assure that the reform meets its goal. Recommendations should distinguish those who need to be imprisoned from those who do not, taking into account both the gravity of the crime and the likelihood of recidivism. Not all offenders who commit a certain type of crime are equally at risk for reoffending, and the goal of the recommendations is to reduce the prison population by identifying and separating the lower-risk inmates from the higher-risk ones. Reducing the prison population requires the participation and cooperation of local governments. Recommendations should not shift responsibility over a person from the state to local authorities without providing the necessary resources to support that move. Safely reducing the prison population is a long-term effort that will exceed the life of the Commission. There must be infrastructure in place to sustain the reform in the future. I'll stop there in my reading from the Commission's report. That background information and the perspective it supplies and the guiding principles and assumptions it describes are as valid today as when the report was published in 2016. The report goes on to make 27 specific action recommendations that I won't get into here because they're so specific to Illinois and to the time of the report. You can read those in the full report at the website of the Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority, linked in the notes to this episode. Among the most important things I hope you take away from the portion of the Commission's report that I have shared are overuse of prison as a solution to crime problems is not only ineffective and hugely expensive, it's counterproductive, resulting in more crime, not less. We can't punish our way out of our crime problems, and therefore police our way out of our crime problems, especially in high-crime communities. Therefore, rather than persisting in our currently dominant punishment approach to criminal justice, we need to pivot to a problem-solving approach. A problem-solving approach leads naturally to replacing overuse of prison with more effective and ultimately less costly solutions best delivered at the local level. But increasing the capacity of local communities to scale up and effectively implement those local solutions requires funding on a scale that meets the need. To think those additional funds can come from savings from sending fewer people to prison not only gets the cart before the horse, it is also mathematically unrealistic given the deep reductions in our prison population that must precede any substantial reduction in the costs of running the prison system. That is the resource riddle. And solving it is essential to public safety and community health. With that background in mind, you'll be a much better informed listener for our upcoming episodes featuring interviews of remarkable people who've been to prison and returned to build new lives people whose stories need to be told, whose voices need to be heard.